All right, let's take a look at this week's assignment first. And this, you'll see why I brought that up. I'm just going to point out certain parts of it. Uh, so this week's assignment is just going to be transitioning into drawing full bodies, but without any of the muscular construction just yet. We're getting the base full body. And so that's going to go back a few uh, assignments to the bean body is going to be one option for that. So you can draw a bean torso if you want to for that, or you can draw an egg and box torso which would be the one before the bean, I believe. Um, our final uh, resting place for that is going to be a little bit further on where we're going to change the bean torso into a robo bean, um, where it's sort of a more constructed egg in box, but that would be a good place to start if you wanted to. Uh, we're going to use a simplified Loomis head, which means just the ball direction and face wedge. Uh, and if you want to indicate where noses and ears attached, then that's fine. But you really can just treat that as uh, two dimensionally for now. Just a big C shape for ears, or if you're a little bit more familiar, it's sort of a, um, a semicircular kind of wedge shape. And then for the nose, same thing. You can just have like a wedge sticking on the front if you want to, but no real details. We're looking for just kind of the underlying construction. And then cylinders for the upper and lower limbs um, to mimic the bones, and so meaning thinner. And the hands and feet can kind of be whatever you want for the moment because we haven't covered that in any kind of detail. And so you're just going to have to make do for the time being. Okay. Um, any necessary props. So if they're holding onto a stick or a rope or something like that, but leave the clothes off, leave the hair off, leave the details of the body off. So we're looking for a sort of a really advanced stick figure. And I'm asking for 30 of them this week. So that's the bad news. Bad news is that number is pretty big. The good. I don't. I, I love you guys and I want you to be strong and so I'm making you uh, drink your milk and so your skeletons can get good and strong for the skeleton army at the end of October. Um, 30 of them is a daunting number but break it down by how long you have. You have an entire week. If you did five every day you'd be done you know before you hit the seventh day. Uh, if you did 10 every day, it would only take you half the week. If you did 15, you'd only have to do two sessions. Okay, so you guys can do how, this. How big do you want them? I don't really care about big. I need to okay. be able to see them. But if you, how, what are what size paper are you drawing on, Lydia? Um, um, I usually use the sketch or the one that you um ask for the big one. 11 by 17. Big. Yeah. Okay, so on an 11 by 17 sheet, it's like two pieces of paper. Where's my pen never work right away? There we go. Uh, 11 by 17 is like two pieces of paper side by side like this. And okay. so if, if you're going to draw sufficiently large, I would say you could divide into one, two, three, four, five, six. So six, but you can't divide it into five. You might be able to do nine per page, maybe 12 per page. Um, and this would be the entire 11 by 17, right? I know I'm doing it yeah. kind of sideways. Um, or if it's a single piece of paper, then probably like just nine. Okay. Yeah. Because I have another 20 to do for my other class. <laughs> what other class? Not my painting class. <laughs> and, and they're making you paint 20 people? No, paintings, different things. Oh, I hope they're simple. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, well, good luck to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> All right. So that's what we're doing this week. And, of course, I've got the link and recommended settings for the Quick Gestures site if you guys are using that. You can find your reference from other places if you like to, but that one's a nice, convenient one. I recommend not spending more than 10 minutes. If you guys spend more than 10 minutes on these and you can't get the egg, the direction, and some cylinders, work on speed by trying to get it in the next one. Okay. Sometimes you guys will obsess over details and corrections and I don't want you to do that. Uh, realistically, I'd say five minutes is probably fine for this ask because uh, inevitably when we get to a full figure with construction and muscles, these steps that I'm asking for homework this week are the first two steps. Step one being a gesture drawing, step two being the basic construction. Then step three would be adding on the muscle groups. Um, so this would be like the first half of a full 
figure drawing. Okay, so about five minutes is a reasonable time to spend. Don't go over 10 per drawing at that point. Just leave off and work on the next one and try to improve your speed from there. Okay, go slow enough that you don't have to um, rush or you know try to sloppily construct the figure, but go slow enough that you can be nice and careful as well. Okay, any question about that assignment besides the details of? this stuff that I'm about to talk about. Do you want the hands, uh, uh, hands, the arms and legs to be just simple sticks or cylinders? Just simple cylinders. So by that I mean if we had a, let's say a gesture where this person was reaching up and over like this and I don't know what they're doing with their hand, they'll just do something like that. I want a cylinder for each one of these two spans at least. The hand can stay exactly like this, but the chest needs to be some sort of constructed egg, at least this one, you know, which is not entirely what we'll end up using, but something that shows me the three-dimensional direction. Then the limb itself, however you see those wrapping lines, use a fairly thin cylinder for this because we're going to build on top of it as we go, but not really much more complex than that. Okay. If you want to put a center wrapping line on that, it's okay. He's so, He's dunking. Yeah, there we go. He's dunking this guy's head. There we go. I get easily distracted today, I think. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about skeletal landmarks because this is going to be very, very helpful for life drawing uh, from this point forward. Um, up here on screen, I have one of the uh, pictures that I use in the article here about landmarks, but Proko has an even better one but it includes maybe an overwhelming amount of notes on it. So take that in for a second. These are lots and lots and lots of names, which you mostly don't have to memorize. There are some important ones on here, but these points on the body are what we're paying attention to. They are what you'll be able to observe in a person almost regardless of their angle you know, they will be visible even if they are overweight, they'll be visible regardless of clothing most of the time. Uh, they'll usually be visible um, male or female, but some of them change based on that, especially in the sternum and the ribcage area, and then the hips as well tend to be more visible in females than males. Uh, but these are useful because they will give you the strongest impression of the angle and tilt of the body parts in a way that is reliable. Okay, the things that are unreliable are all the squishy parts. Okay, your flesh, your skin, your fat. So we can't use like your navel, for instance, because it moves around. On this skeleton here, if I'm just going to draw in like a little tummy here, if this person has a really big tummy, then this navel is going to move from being about here to maybe a little bit lower down. And then if we were looking from the side, of course, right? then it's going to stick further and further out and down depending on how fat or obese this person ends up being. So we just can't use that as a measurement for the center line of the body. Um, same thing goes for nipples. Although on guys, we don't have a whole lot of muscle uh, or fat on these sides. Um, for women, you have much greater amounts of tissue, right? And so then they go out and down and then sometimes they stretch out in shape. So we can't use those things. We've got to use skeletal landmarks because those bits don't really change shape that much except where the skeleton really is a different shape already. So the big exception is going to be how wide um, the hips are for either males or females. Sometimes the, um, and I forget what you call it, but the passageway in the inside of the um, pelvis, that can widen um, from childbirth, so especially in older women. But since that's such deep tissue stuff, we're not going to see that change, but we will see the angle change on the outside of the body. Okay, So this is a more complete list, but we're going to just focus on the other picture that I've got there because it's the ones that we really need right now. And although we've got all of these different uh, landmarks listed on the limbs, we don't really need to formally look at those just yet. There are some really helpful ones though I will say in the knee area for helping to shape that because a lot of these are going to be pretty obvious already. Um, limbs bend right in the middle. Usually you can tell where that's happening no matter what. Even if the person has a straight limb, 
you don't really need to formalize that one so much, although some of these can help with angle eventually. So we're just going to focus on the torso for the time being. Okay, I do have the list that I want you guys to look at written out here, but I'm just going to quickly go through that um, here on camera so that you can tell exactly what I'm talking about. So we're starting out with the clavicle. Let me turn this down just a little bit so I can draw over the top of it. So we're starting out with the clavicle, and the clavicle is these two bones, right? And on the back, we can't really see, except we can see them intersecting here with the scapula, right? And this knob is the upper limit of the scapula where it's uh, coinciding with the clavicle. Notice the shape right now is a little bit flat compared to what you probably expected. When you think of a clavicle or a, a uh, collarbone, you're probably thinking about something like this, which is true if you look down at it. Right, so if you're hovering above, and let's just say like the person's skull is here, and their nose is here, and we're looking down, you can see this, you know, directional change. But from the front, it's flattened out quite a bit. Usually, you can see just a little bit of it. So keep that in mind um, that it does have a more interesting shape to it. But um, from the front, it's relatively flat. The parts that you can see on the clavicle, usually you can see this direction change that happens right about here in the middle. Um, that sticks out on a lot of people and if you put your hands on your own clavicle you can probably feel that pretty easily. And then also this point that sticks up here you can find pretty easily. Usually on a lot of people that's going to be a pretty obvious um, spot. So this is great but the arm or the, sorry the shoulder has a huge amount of motion potential. So we can't just draw a line through these points and say that's what the you know, the torso is doing. Maybe it's what the shoulders are doing, but the shoulders could be doing two different things. They could be doing this, for instance. And so if we draw a line through that, we're going to put the torso going this way suddenly, and that doesn't make any sense in the pose. So right away, I put clavicles first because they're one of the most misleading skeletal landmarks on the torso because they have the highest range of motion. So be very careful about that. Okay, if you are shrugging both your shoulders, you could probably get them about as high as this before you start to cram meat into meat and not be able to move, right? So there are certain muscles that attach to the upper portion of the clavicle, and then you've got your neck muscles. At about that height, you're not going to really be able to get much more pinch than that. That moves the um, top of the, the arm up to here, okay? And so all of these muscles below are going to stretch out. They're going to make a different shape on the torso. But remember that the rib cage itself is pretty inflexible. It's not going to move around uh, or it's not going to bend very much at all. It is going to move around a lot because the spine on which it's attached, that is very flexible, especially in the upper reaches where it's more flexible. But the shape of the rib cage is going to flex only just a little bit. Okay. So hopefully um, you're at least a little bit familiar with the, the kind of motion range of the body. But I found that a lot of people don't really realize um, what the bones are doing underneath the skin when I start talking about this. Everybody good so far? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Uh, one thing I will point out just because as an animator it irks me, um, your arm, right, is not capable of rotating much farther than about here okay it's inward you can rotate farther that's fine but it's not capable of rotating much farther than about here if you're going to reach any higher than that it's your shoulder that's helping out okay so if you just try like with your off hand grip the top of your shoulder blade like right here is where i'm talking about and push down firmly and then try to rotate your arm outward and you'll find you hit a limit which is pretty low down you probably won't even get it horizontal or even close to horizontal. So if we're imagining this line for the arm, without using your shoulder at all, you shouldn't be able to rotate your arm out here. Everybody trying it? Yeah, yeah. I can't do it. It's weird, yeah. right? You probably never thought of that. But now ease up, just leave your hand there, but allow your shoulder to rotate and then reach upward towards the ceiling and you'll feel the entire time that this is pinching higher and higher and higher until it gets to about here 
and your arm feels like it's capable of reaching all the way up suddenly. Okay? So just know that whenever you've got a person with arms higher than their shoulder height, they have already started to rotate their clavicles up. And if they're reaching above their head or toward their head or face, they're definitely shrugging their clavicles, definitely. Because there's just no way to get your bones in alignment without doing that, okay? Usually not such a big deal for figure drawing because we kind of innately feel that and start to put that in anyway. But with 3D models, I've seen crimes committed with the um, rigs that I provide students where they're reaching straight up from this point with the clavicles down and it looks horrifying, like they've broken their arms. So don't do that, okay? Um, the range of motion of the clavicles is uh, also forward to backward. So just try really quick. You could put your fingers on your clavicles and then try to um, pinch your shoulders forward so your back is rounding out and you're creating a uh, V shape in the front. You can't go very far in this direction. I'll say that if we're looking straight down at the rib cage, and we had this sort of angle to start with, we could get to about here maybe, and that's about it. So if these were initially pointing that direction, we can get to about here, okay? So a decent amount. Um, try going backwards, the same thing is true. You can get, you know, maybe a 30 degree total. I mean, I'm probably being far too generous with this drawing here, but this is kind of the range potential of your clavicles. Everything else is your arms, um, your actual upper arm bones rotating in their socket, okay? The reason for this, that we've got that huge potential, and by, by the way, this is like one of the biggest motion ranges for any single bone in your body. I mean, it's probably matched by the humerus um, in that you've got a huge potential there, but I would say this one's probably even larger because we are based kind of around the idea of using our arms and our dexterity in our hands for everything that uh, makes us viable as a creature, right? So think about like um, we come from an ape ancestry, climbing, swinging, carrying, throwing, right? Lifting, pulling, all of those things involve arms. So human beings are based partially around our arms and partially about around our upright walking posture, which we'll get to when we get to the lower back and the legs. Um, so we've got a huge amount of, of potential motion for our shoulders. Because of that, we're also going to discover that there are tons of different muscle groups connected to these um, shoulder bones, which means that they are kind of a complicated area. Okay, um, This range of motion is matched on the back by the scapula, which are these two triangular shaped bones, right? Most of the time, what we can see from the outside is the inner ridges of the scapula where they're pushing up against more meat, and sometimes a little bit of the top, but then of course this notch we can also see, okay? So they are mirrored on the left and right sides of the back, and they are part of the support structure that allows us to have such a huge range of motion. Uh, one of the interesting things about scapula, if I erase that so we can just see, is that they're not really attached to anything back here. They're kind of free floating over the rib cage. So whereas elsewhere in the body, we oftentimes have a bone to joint to joint attachment, right? The arm bones connected to the shoulder bone, shoulder, yeah, you yeah, know. On the scapula, we don't. Right? It's got a big kind of free floating side and then it's got this attachment side over here. Okay, But there's so much meat attached to the scapula that they don't like get out of place or anything very easily. They're being attached on the top, on the sides, on the bottom, out to the arms, everywhere. Okay, But they are a very interesting free floating structure. Just know that the scapula do sort of everything that the clavicle does also. Okay, so if the clavicle can rotate way up here, that means the scapula has to rotate 
way up here also and you'll get something like this happening with those bumpy ridges disappearing as it does this for the most part. They can also pinch backward into the center and if you do that they tend to get very vertical and stop at about here where they're running into the erector muscles and kind of smashing everything together. So you can pinch the scapula back extremely but at this point you're going to have an almost uncomfortable amount of backward motion on your clavicles. Okay, um, They can't move away from the surface of the rib cage or anything like that. They just slide along it. So they slide around the, the egg shape of the rib cage. Everything good so far about that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and remember this is by far the most complex part that we're going to talk about, the clavicle and the scapula. They're at the top of both of the two sections that I mentioned, the front of the torso and the back. But since they work in tandem, I thought it would be good to mention them both at the same time. Okay? All right. So the next on our list, we've got super stern or suprasternal notch. I always say it wrong. Suprasternal notch. That's this. Okay, right here at the base of the neck, at the top of the sternum, which is the necktie shaped thing. This is the necktie shaped thing. Okay? The sternum is a very solid piece of, I guess it's it must be bone, not cartilage, although I'm a little shaky. Okay, when I look at my skeleton behind me, it's indicated as bone, so it must be solid bone, and the rest is cartilage. Yeah, the sternum, right? Yeah, it's solid bone, but it takes a while to like completely solidify. Yeah, so in adults, it's going to be nice and solid, but it is attached to with cartilage. That's this red portion of the rib cage, which would be the more flexible part of the rib cage. Um, so it's right in the middle. It's there to protect, you know, the heart and all of the, the lungs and stuff and really give a nice solid attachment point for the ribs in the front. You can see the ribs are bounded by the sternum in the front and then they go around the back and sort of tuck into the vertebrae for the most part. Um, some of them on the back do not wrap all the way around. We've got a couple on the very bottom here, um, but most of them kind of feed into this arc or this arch on the bottom of the sternum. And so this is what I'm talking about when we say that the rib cage is a very solid, um, inflexible piece. It's a little bit flexible, just a bit, to accommodate breathing for one is one of the times when you will actually feel your rib cage change shape so it can stretch outward and inward just a little bit. It can bend back and forward just a little bit. These side panels are kind of flexible a little bit in that if you pushed on them hard they would change shape but really it's meant to not move that much okay um, sort of like if you've ever felt a turtle shell or something it is a little bit pliable um, this sternum in the middle of the chest is a nice reliable um, piece of bone but you can't see it if your subject is overweight or female and has larger breasts so the super sternal notch however is visible on just about everybody unless they've got an excessive amount of fat folding in the neck or turkey waddle in a older person okay and that is always dead center because it's right there at the top of the sternum so one of the most reliable things that you can look at for the front of the um, torso the seventh cervical vertebrae over here on the other side is the counterpart to that um, all of the vertebrae have spines that stick out of them so if we were looking at them, let's see what we would do. This way would be the cervical ones, this way would be the um, thoracic, and then the lumbar would go the opposite way. They also get smaller as we go up. So the most flexible ones are the ones in the head, the cervical ones. The thoracic ones are, are a little bit less flexible and they support the rib cage. And then the lumbar, which you've probably heard referred to in like advertisements for chairs and sofas and stuff, are the least flexible and they're also the thickest but they have these little spines sticking out of them that you can see if you look at an anatomy chart and up here at the top this one is the most prominent the seventh cervical it's where we transition from the neck to the torso and you can usually feel it if you reach around back um, up between your um, shoulders sort of right where your neck begins you can kind of feel that one oftentimes we can see it as well uh, particularly pronounced if the person is thinner or in adolescence you tend to be able to see that a little bit better okay so there we go we got those two for nice solid markers there's more though um, these 
tips of the rib cage, the two front tips. Because of the way that the rib cage changes shape, so it's this big backward laying egg for the most part, but at some part I've been mentioning we kind of trim this off and also we kind of go back this way really underneath the skin. Um, this sort of represents a point right around here somewhere where it is most prominently sticking away from the body. And if you're thin enough to, to feel that just sitting down, then you can probably clearly identify where that begins. And if you're bending backwards, then it's very apparent where that is also. Okay, that's the beginning of this sort of thoracic arch, which is usually pretty prominent and marks the beginning of the abdominal muscles or the ending of the bottom of the rib cage. So those two points and that arc are also very, very good points to look out for. These ones are reliable, so you can draw a line straight through them and find the pitch or bend of the torso. Okay, in the back, Although sometimes you can see points here and here, usually you can't. Um, so I wouldn't rely too much on that. Um, you can't find those points as readily at least. Okay. Any questions about that just yet? You guys I didn't good? know that um, the, the rib cage was shaped like that where it gets smaller the closer it gets to your neck. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the muscle is very... Uh, concealing yeah I mean we can't see any of that happening under the surface really and there's in that in this part in particular right you're talking about this region there is absolutely no way you're ever gonna see that right even your armpit is the closest you ever get hold your arm straight up and then over your head and then feel into your own armpit and then go down a little bit you can kind of grip the very bottom portion of your scapula in addition to some latissimus muscle and then in between that is as close as you can get to your rib cage up at the top it's a pretty painful thing to do to press into that area because there's just no larger muscle groups left but yeah we just never see that that kind of transition way up in there anybody else got comments about that and then also, of course, there's guts and lungs and stuff inside of there, but your rib cage is lower down in your back also. And that whole area is basically empty except for muscle and, and organs. Uh, so the bone ends right there. So you've got this kind of um, slightly lower level of the, the ribs in the back of your rib cage. Cool. Is, is this, um, are these drawings on, um, under a macho? On yeah, yeah. Okay. So if I, I'm looking at it right now, in fact, uh, they're the latest module, the skeletal landmarks, and then we'll um, we also took a brief look at the homework assignment for this week. But yeah, they're all in here. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And the links lead to um, the Proco website where he's got even more detailed uh, illustrations. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's where we are so far. So take a look at for those two points in the front of the rib cage. Um, I'm looking for what are the points called? Tenth rib tips is what they're called on the Proco site. I've never actually named them except to say that they're part of this arc. They're the two f foremost points of that arc. And also you can think about them as kind of the two bounding points for the abdominal muscles, which sort of attach within that arch entirely. Okay. Um, another kind of interesting thing is that you sort of get a triangle created by the most reliable points on the torso. So you get this one, this one, and this one. Those three kind of create a triangular relationship between them, and that's pretty reliable. The shape of this triangle is not going to change too much except by um, the way that the body is bending or twisting. So you can pretty much rely on that it's not going to stretch because the rib cage is stretching it's not going to compress because the rib cage is compressing so if you can memorize that shape that relationship and then recognize that on a model you can be pretty sure that the reason it's changing shape is due to angle differences and rotation not due to anything happening to the person okay same thing not true for these perspective of that triangle exactly Right? But the same thing is not true of these two points, right? They will change because the body is doing something, not because of perspective. Okay. All right. 
So then moving on down, oh, uh, so I've got uh, the, the trivia question one, which everybody likes usually. This little thing right here, that's the xiphoid process. So just because it's fun and it's nice to know these anatomy terms sometimes, we don't actually see that from the outside. It is possible to fracture or break that off by accident if you're hit strongly enough just underneath your sternum. But that's the xiphoid process, just kind of an interesting thing um, to note. Okay. Um, coastal cartilage arch, 10th rib, scapula, 7th cervical vertebrae we've covered. Um, oh, right. Okay, so I put a note on the spine in here to say that although on the back of a person, you will see a cleft going down the middle of the spine. Don't treat that as a ironclad representation of where the spine is, because depending on how developed those muscles are, or how overweight the person is, it will shift away from the um, spine significantly, and it will be misleading. So sometimes, because we do a lot of gesture drawings, people put their gesture line right through that line when they see it. That's not always where the skeleton is exactly. I had no idea. Yeah, well, because all those muscles have mass, right? So what we're talking about is that the erector muscles are two tubes like this going up next to each other, and they even change shape a little bit as they go along. And what you're seeing is this cleft. Well, that cleft is going to be some kind of point in here somewhere, but the spine is actually over here, right? It's it's the thing that they are wrapping around. And the spines go up this way, which you actually think of as uh, the spine is named after these little points that stick out and away. And then there are two handles on the side, kind of like this, sort of in a cross section. And these are the muscle groups here. So really the bone is significantly inside of that point. But we'll, yeah, we'll do a little bit more on that as we're going into muscle groups and things. And you can see, like, look how big these these spines get towards the bottom here. They stick out pretty prominently. And the spines actually get longer towards the um, top up here. All right, let's see. Um, the Oh, the sacral triangle. Yeah, that's another one. So down here at the bottom, these are your hip bones, right? But we actually have names for them. So they are the iliac crest. So the iliac crest is the entire kind of butterfly shape on the top here that wraps all the way around okay and there's um, two points to be aware of that we can normally see first you could actually potentially see, see the whole crest or at least the uppermost points of the crest if you are able to put your hands on your hips or what you think of as your hips and really feel in there you can kind of feel the ridge going along especially in a very skinny like you know uh, model skinny person you might see them poking up above the level of the belt line, okay? But the points that we're normally concerned with are the ones that form the sacral triangle back here, which really don't look like points at all. They just kind of look like a little V-shaped divot in above the butt. And then these two points on the front, which are called the aces, which I never remember the name of ever, and I always have anterior superior iliac spine, aces these points, forward points of the aces. Um, those points are very often visible, even in a person that isn't super skinny, okay? And if you can see those points, you can always reliably draw a line through them to find the tilt of the pelvis, okay? The same thing is true of the sacral triangle in the back. Um, you can almost always see this triangle in some capacity, mostly because it's bounded by um, these ridges here, which support the greater gluteal muscles, and they're the thing that kind of bounds in that area and leaves it flat. Um, but if you can find that triangle and memorize its shape, if it's distorted at all like this, then you know it's because of perspective, not because anything is happening to the pelvis. The pelvis is completely inflexible for the most part, except during like childbirth. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Last bit, and I mention it in the notes as well. These here and here are the greater trochanter. That is not the hip. Okay, that's not the hip. Um, that's not the asis. That's not the arch of the hip, right? That's not the pelvis at all. But sometimes people will misidentify it and think that the pelvic box is this large. 
okay, instead of actually being more like this large. Okay, so that is a potential place for you to have distortion in your estimates. If we look on the front, here are the bounding edges of the rib cage. Go down and you hit that point, the ACES, right? A little bit further down from that, we have the greater trochanter, but usually there are a little bit of extra mass on the sides of that, particularly in women, uh, where it can make it appear to be much, much wider than the hip bones actually are. Okay, so just be aware that from the iliac crest to the trochanter, there's this outward flaring angle, even in men, okay, that can be misleading. So don't measure from there. It's an important landmark to identify where the um, start of the humerus is, but it's not where the box for the pelvis is going. Okay. All good? Yep. Okay, any questions about any of that? Because that's basically the whole list for now. That's a lot to cover. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is the truncated list. This is the one that's just relevant to finding the position of the torso, essentially. And remember, the things that we're ignoring, don't use belly button, don't use nipples, okay? Not reliable. And although the cleft in the center of the back is not as um, crazy, generally don't use that for the position of the spine you can definitely use it for the kind of motion of the spine because it's going to mirror that pretty closely but not for the position uh, also the the um, two lines created by the scapula those aren't representative of what the torso is doing either they're representative of what of what the um, clavicles are doing so don't use that okay so those ones i just drew don't and let's just include those don't use these, don't use this, don't use those, don't use these, maybe a little bit use this one. Use the other ones. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Questions, anything about that? Are you going to do an example of how to like draw? Um, I was on Thursday. Do you want one right now? I mean... I could probably luck out and find a good one if I look at the poses. I learn thing. best when you do the examples, to be honest. Okay. All right, let me, let me load it up. I'll find the pose on the other screen because sometimes it lies to me and gives me naked people instead of, like, clothed people when I'm asking for it. Let's see. We want clothes and costume, unfortunately. We want type full body. There we go. Okay, let's see what we get. Nope. Although, okay, actually I did get one good one. Let's see. Oh my god. The guy's holding a shield up over his whole body. That one's easy. I think these are all going to be closed, so I can show you guys what I'm looking at. <laughs> Can't see anything. Can't see it. Well, you know what? We can almost see the suprasternal notch there. Almost. I just know that that tendon right there is heading towards the suprasternal notch. That's how I know that. Um, you can see it in her. See that? That's where it is, right there. So these two tendons form a V. They point right to it every single time. I'm trying to see in her hips. Can we see anything? Not really. No chance. Um, you can see clavicle heading up over to this point over here. You can also just see it underneath there. This point of the ribs here, and we're actually seeing more of like the oblique muscles there, is probably that 10th rib tip that I was talking about earlier, probably. See, the thing is I probably need to find nude models and censor them if I'm gonna record it for YouTube. That's why I have a different day where I demonstrate. Okay, here we go. This is that thoracic arch that I was talking about. This is the sternum. That is definitely the suprasternal notch. You can see the clavicle extending upward to facilitate the arm motion. Okay, Down there deep in the pit of the armpit is as close as you'll ever get to the rib cage uh, on the upper part up here, unless it's right here in the middle, potentially. So these two points, boom and boom, do give a very strong sense of motion for this. Unfortunately, in the back, and she's twisting so much, 
the um, triangular, the sacral triangle is probably right here right now, which we can't see because of her dress, but I could draw over this one. So I think I've gotten like, so far in this entire list, like two or three that I could use to draw. Let's look at the list and see. Okay, this one, which we've seen before, clearly see that front tip of the rib right there. Okay, very, very easy to spot that. We can also see the pinch happening in the back with the scapula, but it, we're at such an extreme angle, we're practically looking at it sideways, so it's not much help. Sacral triangle is going to be about here, but we can't really see it. Okay, unfortunately, for some reason on her, we can't see clearly the iliac crest, though I can tell you with pretty much 100% certainty it's right about here. But I can't really actually see it. So, eh, unfortunate. Um, this is the guy I was complaining about. Yeah, very helpful, thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Her costume kind of covers up the sacral triangle, unfortunately. So I thought maybe there was a chance there. Although we could see um, greater trochanter, remember that point that I was talking about? That's basically right here, although I think she's thin enough to kind of make it a little bit misleading. This outward sort of bulge in the leg, that's kind of where the um, greater trochanter is for the humerus. So that's one. You can almost see the seventh cervical vertebrae as well on that one. Um, where was the other? So I'm going to use the ballerina and I think her, could I see anything on this guy? No, not really. Sort of can see the clavicle slash um, uh, scapula notch here, but I don't, I don't really think that's what it was. So I can draw over this one. Oh, this guy. Oh, you know what? Actually, we can see the thoracic arch on this guy, despite how much clothes he's got on. And because of the um, sternocleidomastoid, we can find out where the suprasternal notch is, which would be right about here. So I guess I could use that one as well. All right, let me grab these and throw them into Photoshop real fast. So that one, and this one, and where'd the ballerina go? There we go. All right. There. Here. And here. So did you want me to draw based on these pictures, or did you want me to trace over the picture to show where anatomical things are happening? Over the picture. Yeah? Okay. Right here, make them as big as I can. And then where's the third one? All right. So then, get this up at the top. So this would be the thoracic arch right here. We can tell that because these two muscles, they go from ear to the suprasternal notch, are right here. Look how short that sternum is right now. Do you know what that tells us? The fact that, that's right. It tells us that it is leaned backward because this line is incompressible on our skeleton. You can't squeeze it. It's not gonna happen. And so it means that as an egg, so if I drew over this, this egg is bending away from us pretty extremely. So if I just drew like a center line around that egg like that, here would be the top of the egg. Let's move that off. See, it's, it's bending away from us pretty extremely because of that shortening effect. Um, although by the time we get down to his belt, that's not really happening anymore. So we can see his belt is only doing about like this. And so it means that his rib cage is bending more, his belt is bending less, okay? So his pelvis is not really doing the same thing. Does that make sense? Hopefully? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what I'm trying to not do is like follow his shirt and his pants line. Like we can see this crotch stitch in his pants going like this direction, and we can see his shirt kind of going like over here and stuff, which would lead me to believe that his body is doing this, which maybe it is a little bit, or maybe it's way more subtle than that. And it's just the fact that he's lifting this arm and pointing this arm out that's creating that large bend. 
after all the same things happening with his leg, he's lifting this leg, he's dropped this leg, all of that is doing that to his clothes, but maybe his rib cage and his pelvis aren't doing that at all, right? So that's why we try to look for these skeletal landmarks as opposed to all of the surface detail, which is doing who knows what. Okay. Uh, on him, can't really see any other skeletal landmarks. I mean, his, his hips are somewhere in here, but his pants are so crazy, there's no chance we're going to see any of that. Let's see. Oh, wait, this is the second one. All right, so for her, definitely this right here, that's that 10th rib, okay? So we've got this line that would go straight up here and down for her rib cage. And notice it cuts the breasts off because of course they're on top of the rib cage. They're on top of the muscle that would be under there, in fact. Most of the time with a female model, you're not going to have highly developed uh, pectoral muscles and then breasts on top of that. You kind of get one or the other for who knows what reason, but in female bodybuilders who have more highly developed chest muscles, they tend to have um, smaller breasts for some reason. Maybe it's a hormone thing or something, I'm not really sure, but you're not typically going to have a lot of muscle mass, you're just going to have breasts on top of that. So one or the other kind of, but we can at least tell that that is where this kind of direction change happens for the rib cage, sort of like that, okay, and not really descending that far, okay. As far as other markers, I can see the mastoid muscle right here, so it's pointing towards the um, suprasternal notch, but it's on the wrong side. The other one would come from this earlobe down that way, but it's kind of wrapped around the neck right now, so we can't see it. Um, there is a little notch right here, which is one of the endpoints of the clavicle, but I can't actually see where it goes from there. We have the cleft right here, which again is moved outward from the spine, so we can just be sure that's not where the spine is. The spine's going to be somewhere in here, deeper inside of the body. Okay. In fact, if you want to see that, the place where the spine likely is, it's likely here and then here. It has to go more towards the center than you think. Probably somewhere in there, like that's where the actual spine would be. Okay. Um, I said that I could see sort of where the hip bone is. It's sort of like there. If we are just to treat this as like a simple box, then that simple box would be like this. Okay. But that's not really what the pelvis bone does. The pelvis bone has sort of a crest in the middle of it. And so probably like this would be like what the pelvis bone is doing inside of there. But this would be the asis point right here. Okay, right in the front. Okay. Good so far? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the ballerina. All right, so for her, I can see, actually, okay, so it is interesting then. We've got this core shadow on her chest, right? Here, here, kind of like that, This the shadow shape. One of those is the um, thoracic arch, and then one of those is her breast, okay? This is her breast right here, and so her nipple for the breast would be right there. This is the um, point for the 10th vertebrae, this is the thoracic arch right here, okay? Luckily, we've got the suprasternal notch and the sternum to help us figure out what's what, but without that, it's pretty easy to mistake one for the other if the model is bending in such a way that it makes it hard to tell, or they're really skinny. So you might be forgiven for thinking like, this is the thoracic arch, which is actually just the bottoms of her breasts, right? This is actually it right here. Okay. So there is a little gap between pectoral muscle and abdominal muscle, and you can find that on men. Sometimes you can see that gap on women as well, and sometimes it leads to a kind of misidentification of which is which. Okay. Uh, very clearly you can see that shape for the um, clavicle, and in fact that's a very, very pronounced shape 
almost like this in that one, which is even more extreme than I'm used to seeing it. Usually it's, it feels a little bit more gradual than that, but I think that she's in a pretty extreme pose or just has that shape for some reason. You can kind of see the place where it attaches here above the deltoid muscles, um, where that would be the start of the attachment for the upper arm, um, but not really. There's too much shadow in here. But we can see the mastoid muscle again, um, which I guess maybe I should have mentioned by now, just because it's so prominent, but it's attaching right to the suprasternal notch. Let's see, so things not to follow, right? Don't follow the costume. Okay, don't follow any of these loops. Or they don't tell you anything. Don't follow the stitch lines, right? They're all hints, but they're not going to give you the answer. This one is probably closer to the actual angle of the, the hip bones, but it could be stomach. We don't really know. We've got to look for skeletal markers to really know for sure. I mentioned that this is probably where that sacral triangle is. And I'm basing that off of just a guess, just because I see this ellipse, then I think, okay, that's the top. This must be the back. The front must be over here. Where's the hip? Um, here, I guess. Okay. So we've got this box created like this, I think, but it's all under cloth and it's really hard to see. So I can't say for certain. Okay. You could definitely place it somewhere in that region and be correct enough to execute your drawing though. Okay. All that makes sense? Yeah. Helpful? Yes. Hopefully? Okay. All right. Then in terms of this lecture, that's all I wanted to cover. And then I want to take a look at your guys' Loomis heads from last week. Oh boy. Okay. Any further questions about landmarks and this week's assignment, which is to draw 30 full body figures? Do you want us to mark all of the landmarks on the things we're drawing or just draw according to those? I would, I would love you to mark them and leave them marked where you use them. Okay. Uh, typically that's going to end up being like um, suprasternal notch, the points of the ribs, sacral triangle, maybe the seventh cervical vertebrae in the back. You don't have to mark like clavicles and stuff like that yet, or trochanter. Just the things that help you position the, the torso and the, the uh, pelvis. Okay. Is that a question? Yeah. Whose question was that? Say it again. Um, I was asking like, what exactly do you want the drawing to look like? Okay, so described here, right? A constructed torso, which is either the bean torso or an egg in box. Simplified lumis head, which means ball and facial wedge. And if you want to add on an indication of ears or nose, that's up to you. Don't do hair. Cylinders for the upper and lower limbs, right? Intended to mimic the bones, meaning they're going to be thin and long, not beefy like the actual armor leg is. And that's it. So essentially what people will do sometimes is they'll look at the arm and they'll build a cylinder like this. Okay. And I don't want that. I want this cylinder. Okay. So not this because that would destroy all the purpose of learning our constructive method. That's where all the actual meat construction is going to go eventually. So it's sort of like a modified stick figure in that way. Be about that thing. Do we not do uh, cylinders for the legs? Or do we not do yeah, legs? the whole body. So you're going to do one for the upper leg. You'll do one for the lower leg, which I can't see here, but you know, you'll indicate where the feet are. However, you're best capable. Something like this will be fine most of the time. Or you know, if you see the foot actually doing something more complex like that, but we're not being specific about that. Hands, do your best. I haven't really talked about it yet, but just some sort of triangular you know, shape like that, it's going to be fine. But I care more about the things that we actually know how to construct. An egg for the rib cage, or modified egg for the rib cage, a box, right, for the pelvis. Okay. And a Loomis head. So, however, I'm capable of doing that quickly. <laughs> Okay. 
So we're looking for a three-dimensionally constructed stick figure, essentially. Uh, I have a question. Mm hmm So this is so you want us to draw the shape in the cylinder? Yes. Okay. It's right here in the instructions, guys. Okay. Not the whole skin. Um specifically say to leave that off, right? So leave off costume. Leave off hair, leave off fat, leave off breasts, leave off muscle, in fact. We're talking about just the base cylinder for the upper and lower limbs and the egg or bean for the rib cage and the box or bean for the pelvis in addition to a Loomis head, simple Loomis head. This is the, the base that we will put all of our muscle groups on top of. Okay. Okay? Okay. Any other questions about that? We good. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to review you guys Loomis heads. Um, would you guys like me to stop recording or keep recording? Which would be most useful to you? Keep recording. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Sure. No preference for me. Sure. Perfect. As long as nobody objects strongly, I think that's probably the better option because then you can look back at it. All right. Who would like me to look at their stuff then? I would. Angel. Gotcha. Take a look. All right. This is pretty decent. And I'd say this number three looks pretty nicely constructed all by itself. I think the proportions on the side plane are fluctuating just a little bit. So the number two, the straight to the side one, that seems right on to me. This one on number five, it seems just a little bit big maybe, and number three just a little bit small. So try to hit that consistency where you're getting at the same proportions every time. For my preference, I would say I prefer three, but really it needs to be just a little bit bigger to kind of mirror that Loomis head properly. I'd say three just because it looks more like what I expect a, a skull to look like, but that's kind of treating it preferentially. The angles okay. look pretty good though, I gotta say. Uh, let me take a look. Number four, they're getting a little bit um, strange in that if I drew a line from here over to the other cut, I would expect an angle something like this which means that, yeah, so we're getting kind of a, a flattening of that angle as we go down. And then by the time we get to the chin, it's, it's no longer doing it. You'd need to cut this part off. See how like, even when I add that line, it looks a little bit more in perspective. Just that line right there. Yeah. So the angle kind of wandered as we went down the, the chin. Cool. Yeah, I mean, in this gen you got right on. Uh, you're tending to make the the chin just a little bit too pointy on these. Uh, allow it to be a bit thicker, kind of like the distance between the eyes. I mean, I know that she's got a very rounded chin, but almost that wide. I, I guess I did a little bit too much. More like here. Okay. Just a little bit more. Let's get back in there. Um, it's looking pretty good. Let's see. A little bit fatter on the ellipse that you're drawing to get to the center of the eyes and to get to the lower, uh, lower portion of the nose. It's looking like it's flattening out a little bit. So maintain a nice round ellipse when you're doing that. Uh, the effect of foreshortening on this one is squeezing this space tighter but you're following the directions correctly. It's just that when you have a strong up or down angle, it's gonna squeeze the further proportions together. Okay. Huh. This one? Yeah, I was what's having that? a bit of trouble. Yeah? With uh, this one? Or well, like, I, I, I assumed there was like a foreshortening type of thing, but I wasn't sure like 
how, like, uh, how, I guess? Yeah, you're almost getting at it, like, backwards, in which if I measure this distance here, compare it to that chin to lower nose, the lower nose to chin is actually bigger in your drawing, which definitely shouldn't be the case. They should be equal, or the further one should be smaller, not the closer one. Okay. So you're kind of going the opposite direction. In fact, I see that with a few of these here now that I'm looking. The distance between what is your center line and your nose line is way shorter in general than chin to nose. So that's happening with this guy down here just subtly. And it's happening with this one up here. And I think it's due to the ellipse that you're drawing to get that nose position not being round enough. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you. All right, who else like me to look at there? I'll go. Wait, who was it? Who said it? James. James, got it. All right, let's see. What's your Ramos? There should be a folder at the top. Oh, was it? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. I felt really, like, felt like they came out really square, and I wasn't really happy with the like a lot of them, but I tried. <laughs> this isn't that bad, though. I think it's just that the top of the head needs to be rounder. And then, like I mentioned in lecture, the two sides actually slant inward, which is something that's going to make it look a little bit strange. Looking at this one, that space is a little bit too long based on your measurement. But I think that the thing that's making it look a little bit weird is that the chin is moving outward and away from the skull, and then you've got way too much jaw, right, in that one. Let me grab that one. Let's download this one, because then I can draw over it, get my downloads folder on my other screen. There we go. So I can drag them into here. Okay, so let's look at that one. So like this one here, just before I do anything else, is basically fine. It just has a little bit of a flattened head. In fact, let's get rid of this. Turn that down so it'll make this easier. Uh, all right, so if this had continued, Right? Just kind of going across like that. It would have been fine. And then if we just fudge this a little bit more to where that line goes like this instead, we're pretty much right there. Just about done. As long as the ears can fit in to these spaces. Yeah. So you, you just about had it with that one. Uh, so let's take a look at this one because that was the one that caught my eye. So ball looks fine. Cut looks fine, center line looks fine, but this is where the jaw attaches, right? It will come almost straight down, and then from this point, right? So that's it. We do have to trim off a little in the back, and then try to make sure that this goes straight down, not outward. Oh, so not like a weird curve like I did? Yeah, like the face will do that sometimes and it can be okay, but the default should just be a straight down. So try to match your, your center line just straight down. What, what's funny is when I draw that kind of skull shape, it almost makes me think Spider-Man mask, and I think that's sure. like a curved down. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Well, and it's because his nose was sticking out, right? So if we did add a nose, which would the, the nostrils would kind of anchor way back here, the tip would be out here, and then we just connect the dots. We get like that Spider-Man shape, you know? So it's like, yeah. okay. That's where it's probably coming from. But we're just kind of doing base construction at this point. So let's see. So some of these, like, okay, so the jaw looks way too long on this one. I can see here's the sphere. Here's that center yeah, point. Uh, my intention was this is he's looking, it's like he's bigger than you and he's looking down at you. Oh, this is an invented one, right? Yeah. Okay. Oops. I got like some selection getting in my way. So if I move this down to where it hits, right, this cut here, and then shrink it. It'll be a little bit weird to shrink this. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Because I'm at a weird angle. It's, it's fighting me. Okay. And I want this line right here. 
going to be about there. So it's a little bit higher, but then also there's the second step that some people missed, right? We got to go this direction, just like you did before out of this one to get that point. So it's this, which means that your chin actually goes right about here. Okay. Okay. So as long as we connect all three of those now with the same kind of line, we end up with a chin that's somewhere around here and then it can right attach up somewhere like that so you can yeah. see now it feels a little bit more like a normal head shape but the fronts really do they do bend a little bit like if you can do a an ellipse every time then it's even better right yeah yeah let's see how i put that like weird muscly neck it'll show you kind of give, give that bigger guy a feel <laughs> um it, it requires knowledge of those muscle groups though. Right. Right. So the reason for that, that muscly guy shape is um, the trapezius muscles and um, probably the, the mastoid muscles kind of bulging. So we got to wait until we can get those muscle groups. You see this one, cause this one looks almost right, but there might be. So I'm not, what I'm not seeing is like all of the angles on just the ball right so we've got here's the center point of the ball but what what direct was it just going like that just straight up and straight over okay so still draw it because this center point of that side face is really important because that's the the ear attachment right the bottom of this mm -hmm. ends up being where the jaw needs to attach so it would come over here and the top of this is kind of like that glasses line so you're kind of moving them back around the skull just a little bit too much. Okay. Yeah. But with that tiny adjustment, so that's probably what I was noticing. We can go back and up here, or we can go straight back like that. Yeah. And then just don't arc the face very much. Like just kind of keep it going straight up and down on the front line of the face. And these arcs actually went to there. So they don't they don't go to here, they go to there. I think I saw that on a Proco video where he was doing it some of it at the top of the circle. Up here? But I, that's why I, I think I saw that. I hope I'm not. not. I I will be very wrong if that's the case. <laughs> the side the side plane? The this this rhythm from bottom of yeah. chin. Yeah, he took it to the top. To the top of the this? Or not the No freaking way did he do that. If I'm that wrong, I'm going to be embarrassed. <laughs> that's where he put it in. Although, oh, oh where you God. have it is more correct in my opinion, because I've... that's where the zygomatic arch, arch sits. Yeah, I mean, it's where the hollow of the cheeks, like if you were elderly, right, this part would yeah. hollow out. Hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with yours, too. That's why I was like, I just kind of copied what he was doing, but I agree with your lines. Well, well because, because this does make sense, right? That's the, the parietal ridge. And this point is where the um, the orbits of the eyes would coincide. But then to keep going would kind of miss that point. So I don't know. Or is he going somewhere in between, like in this line somewhere? No, he's going right where that uh, first dot you put in was. Oh, and, st orbital. and stopping? Or is he continuing to the top? Because that would yeah. be okay. Like, go to there and stop. He's continuing to the top. But it's like, Weird. Yeah. I gotta. I gotta take a second look. I mean, and also, we're not gonna stick with Loomis forever. But I don't know if that's yeah. Loomis or him. Um, they are very, very talented people. There's one guy. He does this shape for every head. This is how he starts a head. How? Yeah. Right. Okay. You tell me which right. direction the head's looking. Um. Left? Yeah, that's the face line. And I don't know what this arc is, but he eventually like plumps it up and puts the perspective in there. And like, it literally looks like you've chopped off pieces of it until he starts constructing it up. And it's really, really weird. But the guy is super talented. So it's like, not all the systems have to make sense to everybody. I'm sure he's got some good reason. I have no idea what it is, but. Yeah, it's a it different artist. Him, yes. It works for him. Yeah, I mean, his stuff looks great too. So, who knows? All right. Um, did we look through all of them, or let's see? No, not all of them. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. So I think you're you're still looking a little bit too superficial. You're looking at like all of the wrinkles and muscles and stuff and trying to represent that. Don't pay any attention to that. Just use this as an angle reference for you know a Daft Punk helmet, basically. Because yeah. that's how we're starting out. We gotta build all the rest of that on. So in this one, I can clearly see that his head is rotated to the right, but in your drawing, it looks right in the middle. That makes yeah, sense? No, I, like after I made like the, the Schwarz, I was like, yeah, his head is kind of crooked. And his head is tilted to the right also. So not just rotated to the right, I found that because his nose is farther to the right than to the left. Also, we can see more of this here, but it's also tilted as in his ears and his eyebrows are uneven because his head is angled slightly to the right. So we're missing all of those subtleties. Okay, so try to pay attention to that. Um, okay, so you're kind of twisting this one around to face us a little bit, whereas the side plane of this Loomis head would come all the way out to about here. Okay. It's, it's a huge amount. It's almost facing directly towards us. So centered here, and you can use the glasses line to see that he's angling his face up, which you did, right? But if it's centered here, right, look how far back you put it. Yeah. Right? You put it I way too... The front of the glasses kind of made me think he was facing more toward us, but... Well, the front of the glasses is very barely visible. If you compare this size to this size, it's tiny. Yeah. Right, so that's the kind of thing you got to do: is start comparing those ratios in order to get those answers. That's a pretty good Jim Carrey face. Let's see, so we've got this. Hmm, it's a little tough to see what he's doing. He's got really expressive eyebrows, but they're arcing upward. Okay, so I think. His head is definitely leaned over to the right a little bit and rotated up just a little bit. So we're kind of looking up into his skull just a tiny bit. Our eye level is somewhere around his jaw. We're looking up at him just a tiny bit, but it was really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like you kind of got that, but you missed the tilt. What is this line here? Is that the center of the face? Yeah. Okay, then you did miss the tilt. So it does need to be more diagonal in order to, yeah, to mimic that. You can also kind of use the ear attachment sometimes. If you can see both the top and the bottom, then it gives that line. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, definitely don't pay any attention to these bumps and bulges like you're doing here. Leave all that stuff off. Treat it like it's a robot for now. Once we have that as a, as a strong um, starting point, adding all the rest of those details becomes much easier. All right. Who else would like me to look at their stuff? I'll go next. Okay. Uh, where? I'm looking for Lydia or Huesner. I'm not seeing it. Huesner. Yeah, but E F G H. Where is it? I know I downloaded it. Uh, into the right folder? Probably not. Maybe not. <laughs> See if you can f find where you put it or put it in this folder because I don't want to just go rummaging around for it somewhere. I think I, because I'm learning the system, so I think I put it on my drive. I'm pretty sure it should be there. Because okay. I even download um, the pictures. I'll, I'll help you with it. Them. I'll help you with it after class, but I need it in this folder. Okay. Okay. Uh, someone else want me to look at their stuff? Uh, I'll, I'll look. Okay. All right. Let's see. They're not bad. Let's see. So this one first, just a little bit short and egg shaped for the initial circle. Right, the initial circle has to be a bit rounder than this. Uh, let me actually download this one because this would be a good one to draw over as well. And let me see what your second one looks like. 
Okay, yeah, I'll download both of these. Take a look at them. All right. Okay, so there's one and two. And I'll turn off all that stuff so I can. All right. Let's take a look. All right, so how you can make sure that this is a nice round shape, like if I'm going to draw a sphere over the top of this, it's going to be like that different. Okay, so what you got to do, use a measuring tool, right? Grab it, rotate it, and then we can see. All right, so we're missing a round shape by about this much. Okay, so make sure you get that first. That said, this cut is actually more round, so you still got pretty good proportions there. We're just missing a little bit of the skull. So if I continue this around, that helps a bit. Okay, um, you miss the baseline of the nose. Baseline of the nose is supposed to come from this cut here, right? So this would be browse to nose right there and then if we duplicate that we end up getting chin right there okay that would come back slightly and attach to the bottom of that cut it would be more like this make sense yeah okay and the reason that looks a little bit odd like on top of this is because if we continue the sphere all the way down here it always is going to look wacky if we do that it's going to look completely crazy a real skull would cut off somewhere around here okay okay all right so let's see you are also kind of bending the face don't bend the face let it be a nice straight line you've got this as your pitch line for your head so from this point it should be that same straight line out. So that would shift your chin back outward. Um, right now it looks like his chin was receding back into his head a little bit. Okay. okay. Um, kind of disagreeing on your angles here. So it's like you got to pick one or the other. Right? But they should match. The front plane of the face and that um, angle line on the side cut they need to be the exact same. They're very close, but they're not quite the same on that one. Oh. Um, where are you drawing the uh, jawline to? I, I, I literally try like to draw the head in an angle. Like. I mean, this line from the the chin to the jaw. Where is it ending? And on the. The front side of the, the front side of the chin. Okay, where is it starting? The other one. Yeah. It's supposed to be facing like this way, but. Okay, I don't know what this way is. I'm saying, okay, so there's a line. Here's the line, I'm gonna trace it. I'm not sure where it's going. Is it going to the center of this cross? Is it going to the bottom of this cut? Or is it going to, like the back of the skull? Um, the to the straight line. A, B, or C. B. B. Okay, good. That's the correct spot. However, on a lot of these, I see it going way below that cut, far too far down. Okay, because really this jaw is going to connect to the center of this eventually, and you can have it drop down a little bit below that line and connect, but you're going way, way farther than you should. So like here, you're like way below even the, the way too large Loomis circle. Okay, same thing here. You're like another another um, half of that cut below the end of the, the side plane. So you can't go that far down. 
Okay, this line has to go basically to the bottom of this and then curve up in order to be accurate. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, you know to cut those sides off, right? Right. So we would end up with more like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, because they're still here. I see them. Got to erase them, or at least make them less prominent. Uh, also, by the time that we got up here, your head is very, very flat. Okay, so try to keep it a little bit more round up on the top like that. Okay. Okay. See the measurements real quick. Center, if that's the side cut, that's where we should be trimming off, not down here. Okay, so if this is the side cut, we should have the sphere, right, going through here. Like this, there we go. And so that's the part where that ends. Then this is the nose line, right? Then one more distance would give us the bottom of the chin here. So I'm not sure what this point is. Oh, that's also the, the, the chin. Then what's this? That's the bottom of the chin. Okay, which one's the chin? Because you can only have one chin if you're talking about jaw. We don't have a measured angle for the jaw. We only have the end of it, which would be where this side plane terminates. Oh. So like technically I could just do this and say job well done, even though that looks bizarre, we shouldn't really do that. Mm. Right? right? That's why we have a sort of pseudo angle for the jaw where we almost reach that line and then we go up. We almost reach that line and then go up, but it's just a little bit, very, very small amount here. Okay. So all told, once I get all of those things adjusted and properly erase out this, we end up with something a little bit more like that. Okay. Okay, so you're, you're extending the jaw way too far down right now. Okay, let's see this one. Yeah, I think some of it is like kind of bad 3D construction going on here, but also the um, the size of that side plane is fluctuating way too much. So over here, we've got this large of a head, but only this large of a side plane. It needs to be two thirds of that height. So it would be more like this big. So that size is just way too small. Okay. okay. Let me see if that happened on the other ones here, and I didn't notice. Um, it's happening a little bit, but not as extremely, and so I didn't really make any mention of it. It is a little small on this one. It's about right on seven. It's about right on one. It's a little small on six, a little small on three. Probably was too big on five. So try to get that side plane a little bit more consistent as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I'll take it. All right. Okay, let's see. And you know what? It's easier to just download them. Let me download it. That way I can draw over it. I will tend to try to put notes in the Google Drive folder if I can, but it's just way easier to draw over the top of these. All right. Let's see if I can spot anything. So this first one looks pretty good. Size of that, position of that, uh, you can drop this back straight if you want to. Yeah, I think the first few ones that I did with that side plan, I ended up uh, rounding that yeah. middle line instead of uh, finding it out. And then this happened where we've got bent face straight line.
fine. And it's like, okay, that almost works, except it receded the chin, right? So just don't do that. Once you got that point, we need to follow that straight line out so that we get a more prominent chin and it's gonna give us a slightly more satisfying look. Gotcha. You can see just the tiny, and I'll, I'll go up here where you did, but it feels weird to me to do that. So small adjustment, but it just kind of made the, the chin feel more three-dimensional. Um, front view, yeah, it looks right on to me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Side view, maybe just a little bit too far this way. Um, because these tend to be two different planes. One of them goes that way and actually attaches to the neck. The other one goes this way and at some point turns into the rest of the jaw. It can go here, 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 sometimes. Most of the time I'd say it would go straight back just a small ways, then all the way up. So just a little bit too deep I felt that point was. Uh, this one's bending too. It's just because you're following this elliptical line across the face and the face shouldn't work that way. So just bring that straight down. You're going to get a prominent chin. At that point, it'll fix a whole lot. I think at some point later down, I caught on to that, but it wasn't like... Like this one. Yeah. Yeah. And this one. Actually, this one's the best one too. So by that point, you were getting used to this system, I think. That was the last one I did. Yeah. Uh, I can't see the sphere any longer that you started with. I erased it. Did it do this? It wasn't that far out to the side. Did it do this? Yes. Okay. I think so. Bring this a bit further back then. Okay. Because that's why I was kind of not sure because the side cut looked flattened out somehow. So if we get that, and then of course it will dive under. Now it looks a little bit more satisfying to me with that little bit of extra back of the head. Yeah, that must have been what you drew originally because I was just missing that little bit of side plane. Um, this got a little bit displaced too, just a bit farther down. Ooh, ow, my elbow. So then that would place the brows right there instead of here. So very, very slight difference, but it would have, um, we're all very picky about faces, so it would have an impact. Yeah. <laughs> we would all notice, unfortunately, everyone notices everything wrong with faces. And so there's just no winning until you're getting it nearly perfect. Is this the actress from uh, Space Force? I don't know. I think she's the daughter in Space Force. I like your page, like your masking method also. It looks like a scrapbook. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And based on these poses of these actresses too, I think you're getting the angles just fine. I like to be really severe with mine just because it helps with the construction. It doesn't lend itself to like looking very good, but it gives me a strong impression of what I need to be drawing. So try try being a little bit more severe with it. Cool. Very nice. All right. Anybody else? We're nearing that time. Fine, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I need some critique, please. Um, where am I looking? Sanchez, Eric. Oh, was it yeah, a folder? It was, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there should be... Okay. Yeah, oh. Your... Okay. Some proportion yeah. things. Please tell me. First, it's the proportion, right? That side plane is not two thirds the size of that circle. And it's because well, okay. So interesting thing happening here. It looks like you were aware of it, but then didn't get the right measurement because all your measurement lines are crooked. Let's see. Are you so you're drawn on paper? Do you have a ruler? Yes. Okay. Do you have a T square? No. Okay. Do you know what a those. Do you know what a T square is? No. Let me check. Shit. 
because it's not the straightness of the lines, it's how parallel they are, or rather how parallel they're not. Yeah, I don't have a C-square, but okay. I can see where this is going. Okay, yeah, right. So that line and that line, they're just about parallel, but that one is not. It should be straight like it, the others. Then. Parallel. So parallel means this part over here is the same distance as this part over here. That's what parallel is. So if you are measuring one time, at least twice, right? Measure on one side, measure on the other side. Measure on one side, measure on the other side. It's the only way to guarantee that they're parallel. Or if your ruler is of a certain thickness, you can use both sides of it to see how far away from the actual ruler this ends up being, right? So I think you were looking at, it appears that you're looking at someone opening their mouth and yelling. You're getting too wrapped up in the details and not enough in the basic technique. Because I'll yeah. tell you, with a rotated distended jaw, the Loomis face would still be over here. Because the Loomis face doesn't rotate its chin. God damn right? <laughs> well, now you're trying to do yeah, more, yeah. right? No, yeah, because I thought that in, uh, mentally it was all like, oh shit, what is this supposed to be? Right, and this makes sense. You're rotating the jaw, that's correct. It's just not what the Loomis head does. You know, and so our Loomis chin would end up way out floating in space here, which would look weird, but it's what that head does. Accurate. Right, okay. and that's what we're trying to get first is this kind of base level accuracy before we try doing the really complicated stuff like a distended jaw, right? Yeah. So first thing, start measuring more. This side cut needs to be like this big, big. right? Because yeah. then this is two thirds of that original. That means hairline is up here somewhere. Brows ends up being about the same, right? Then this is the nose, which would extend this appearance. And also the nose tucks into the shape eventually. So don't worry about it for now. Then we go straight down one more distance and we end up with a chin over here back to around here okay so it would end up being something like that in fact I did something weird I think I, oh I went too far so I'm getting distracted too there we go it'd be more like this okay so yeah don't don't get wrapped up in details try to just do the method to get the nice solid kind of, of technique down first. Um, you're just doing in this one, what Robert was doing is that you're curving the face. So just don't curve the face, stick to the nice straight line. So if that was your line, um, where's the center of this ball? Center would be probably in the middle where the nose is. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean can't. of the ball, right? So the ball is, oh. the center's here, because then I'm trying to get a wrapping line for what you're indicating is happening, and I get end up getting way over here, Shit. right? Um, are you doing these steps in that order? I'm more so just looking at the head and like, all right, the ball should start here. Okay, so well stop then... that. Your intuition's not good enough yet. We gotta train your intuition before you can use it that way. So this is what I need first, right? A ball and a wrapping line that represents how much tilt you saw in that head. That's going to give us a place where if we line up, that's going to give me a point. You got to do the technique because your eyes will deceive you. Your brain will tell you misleading stuff because you haven't trained your intuition yet. I can use my intuition because I've got 10 plus years of practice in this technique. Now my intuition tells me what the technique would tell me. And when it's wrong, I'll still fall back on this, right? But right now you're trying to use intuition in place of technique, but you can't yet because you haven't trained it up. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you're going above. So I'm getting the side plane. I'm getting this headline. There we go. Here's the front line of this skull and that center bit. Then I need the same one down here, the same ellipse. Here's that center point, drop down, same line coming forward, same line going down. That would be my spot. That's my end of nose line. 
one more time. There's my jaw. Okay. Yeah, that's not so far, right. But this is the same thing that happens with everyone, right? They think that, well, here's how I think it's going. And so all of these bits recede because we're not following that nice structural robotic kind of construction. But when we follow that robotic construction, it feels awkward and weird because it's like we know somewhere in us that a person doesn't do that, but we're trying to overcome this illusion created by our brains so that we can start to structure these people in a way that's going to make sense on paper. Make sense? Yeah. So for you, specifically you, be really pedantic about the rules. Be really careful, measure carefully, go slow, all of that. Do not try to use your intuition because it's, it's going to mislead you. It's not going to work. Not the same advice for everybody. Everybody needs slightly different advice. But for you, be super yeah. pedantic about the rules for now. And try to construct everything very carefully. No no, no eyes and nose and stuff. We don't need any of that just yet. We'll work on that later. <laughs> Dude, I think I was trying to like, all right, this is where this is all going, right? Well, yes. Well, for me, I, I was like, all right, <laughs> let's see if I'm, all right, let me look back to this and look back to that and see if they're, accurate and oh well that is looking for resemblance like com yeah. comparing these heads like i'm sure if we looked at the photographs of these people the things i drew look nothing like them that's okay yeah. that's okay do they look like iron man no i, I mean these oh yeah so i thought you meant the ones that the, I the people no no D did what i drew look like iron man like that's all i care about right is it a nice you know iron man helmet at a, at a good angle that's all i'm really trying to do and did i look at the person's head angle and kind of get that from there i'm not looking to get their resemblance in other words because i yeah that's what i that's what i did for this yeah I looking, well we're still looking at the resemblance and it's like oh he doesn't care about that he just wants no. like a robot right like, that. that does not look like her that's okay right this does not look like him that's okay right yeah they are just iron man helmets at various angles that kind of match these people almost like they're like a stop motion actor with those like ping pong balls on them and they're controlling some tron character make sense yeah because we'll build all that other stuff on top. Really, resemblance is the last step in this whole figure drawing thing. We're going to try to just get a person to look even remotely like a person with all their muscle groups as we work. Um, the resemblance part is where you start to fudge all those rules in favor of the ways that people are differently shaped. That's a step beyond what we're even going to do in the class, really. So step one, learn to construct idealistic forms that look nothing like real people. Step two, fudge that stuff so they do look like real people. Cool? Yeah. All right. Very good. Uh, anybody else? We are just about... Uh, would you be able to go over mine? Yeah, of course. All right, let's go back here. Front one looks just about right to me. Let's see the angles. There are some angles that confuse me like this big diagonal one. And I see it a few times. Like I see it over here. I don't know what it is. Like what's that line? I'm not too sure. I did that on Friday, so I'm not sure what I was doing there. I was looking over uh, this first image when I went to do my second set of five, uh -huh. and I just didn't use that because I didn't remember why I even used it in the first place. Yeah, and it's the first thing I hone in on because I don't know what it's for. Like, I can't see the utility of it. I know the utility of the vertical line here. And in this one, interestingly, you don't follow the, your own vertical line. So I'm not sure what happened there. 
But yeah, the other ones, these other two, I think what you're trying to do is some vague kind of 3D compass is what it looks like. Like it looks like you started with, well, I see the head going this way, therefore the other two angles must be these. And that's not true, right? Those other two angles can be a lot of different things. They could be very, very thin like this. They could be one straight over and the other one coming right at us. They could be like this even. We just don't know until we observe. So I think that's what's going on. So don't put in any line that you don't have a reason to be putting in, I guess. And let me, let me, I'll show you what the three lines would be on these. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Okay. All right, so a little bit farther down. So on this one, what the three lines would be, like the the vertical one. I definitely think that's exactly what's happening. The one that goes side to side would follow these, right? So that would be ear, the ear to ear line would go this way. The last one, which would go straight through the front and back of the head, based on what I can see, would be this one, which is why I didn't call that one out as being useless because it looks like it is genuinely going forward backward. And so then the ellipse that you draw plus that line gives us center of brow right there. The vertical line drop down gives us front of the face. All of that looks accurate. The only thing that doesn't is this line that I don't know where it's going to. Is that how you're thinking about constructing this or are you thinking about it slightly different? So the way I remember constructing was doing the ball, uh, finding the, the kind of the, the center axis where it with the the crosshair basically is it tilted a little bit back is it straight up and down i did the first you know well straight line and was this an observation you made then that i think i did later um, oh. i was trying to find the the ear and the front i think that's what that was but that's not even where i put those lines so okay <laughs> not sure what happened with that one <laughs> okay because i was thinking there's two possibilities one you made this observation and then didn't follow through with it anywhere because you didn't know how, or you did it after, like you said, and it just didn't have a relevancy. So try to think about it like this. I put in probably too many axis lines when I start these because I like to be really exacting on where everything's going. But you do need the center point and you do need the front. After that, you don't really need this side to side one, I suppose. I like putting it in because I want to keep everything nice and straight, but you'll find it based on the nose, eyebrows, mouth, chin. So then this one, uh, same thing, your jaw is receding. I can see that. Um, the center seems okay. This is the front line, I think. And this is the side to side line. Did this person have a lot of sideways the, still? No, the first set, I didn't have any uh, pictures. I just did the... Oh, okay. What I wanted to have an angle, I wanted to look kind of upward. So I yes. Did so that, uh, the second line you did that's going for the forward, uh, that was just the cross angle of the tilt line. So this okay. is ears. Not, not all like this would, was a weird one. Yeah. This would be the <laughs> ears. Weird. Yeah. Okay. At that angle, then, if I do the ellipse, like where you've got it, then we've got the center of brows here, right? Drop straight down the way you've got it. That's the center of the face. We're almost looking directly side on to this person. So that would mean here's the center of the side plane and the center of the far side plane. So our side cut is about like about like this or something. Did that really messy? 
that like this. That's about our side cut. I made it shorter because we've clearly got some very strong tilt in the head. Okay, so cutting off there. That means this jaw. So if I can get this. Okay, so our nose line is about here. So our jaw line is about there. And then, yeah, it's just kind of flattened out the jaw, that's all. So kind of like that. And then the side, the other side ear would be like way back over here. So we've got this kind of cylinder in the center of the head tilting towards us, if you can see that. Yeah. Okay. Um, did that make sense? I guess. Yeah. Okay. And then we had the other one. The, the jaws are still receding a bit on each of them. Um, and on this one, we kind of missed it entirely because that's a really difficult angle. So I wasn't sure if I was supposed to do the foreshortening or just go with the Loomis head. So I tried to go more with the Loomis head and keep it straight. But you flattened it all the way out. Like there is there is no perspective on that one anymore. It's lost it entirely. And it's because... Um, the ellipses aren't doing the right thing. Um, you're just kind of drawing straight across instead of following the ellipse, what the ellipse would do. So you can see on your brow line, this is a nice bent ellipse, but on your nose line, it's flat. Yes, that's right at the, when I started doing the nose and going towards the chin, it was when I realized, do I, I was trying to make that decision, do I go with the foreshortening or do I keep it elongated? And that's kind of what made it look what I'm saying is it's not foreshortening that's breaking this. It's that you're drawing a straight line between the bottom of both um, side planes. Okay. You're using that as the nose line when that's not what the nose line is. So I see it on this Anne Hathaway one. I can see it on this one. Now that I'm noticing that's what's happening, don't do that. So there's not a straight line between the two side planes to construct some facial feature um, unless... Oh man, unless, okay, there could be actually, but you're not using it that way. I'll, I'll show you how there could be. All right, because I'll use this one as the example, because what we're doing is taking this ellipse, this is the, the cross section of the head. We're moving it down. We're trying to line it up with the two bottoms of these planes. We could do that, right? Line it up with the two bottoms of those planes, find the center and project that line forward to find this point, or I guess, if we found it accurately enough, we could connect those lines, find that point, and then project that line forward and get the same point. But that's not really what you're doing. Did that make any sense? <laughs> yes, uh, making that, that line should be straight. It's more of a... Well, it is... Okay, so here's a cylinder. Right. And we'll say that this was, formerly in the center of a sphere like that. I'm saying that if we find a point between these two, when we already had a point between these two and we go straight down, wherever the front was from this one, it's going to be the, the accurate measurement from the front of this one too. So it's going to give us the right point like that. But if that doesn't make much sense, don't do that. Okay. Okay. I definitely don't try to find my my nose line that way. But you could, I guess. It would it it does obey the the rules of perspective to do that. <laughs> I feel like I'm making it harder to understand, not easier. I was perspectively trying to just figure it from the bottom of the ellipse on the side of the head like that's kind of the well you got that you got that line correct but that line is in the center of the skull that's what i'm saying okay. like yeah. yes okay then you you are kind of thinking about it this way you got this line correct it's only that that line is right in the center of the skull not on the face you have to project the front line forward to find 
the actual point on the face, on the center line of the face. Okay. And it's because this wrapping line, this belt, this is the outside, right? And then that means this is the outside. And then for the chin, this is the outside somewhere down here. Kind of makes sense? Yes. Okay. Thank God it makes sense because I felt like I was speaking gibberish. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? I'm going to have to go in just a few minutes here. I got to read my boy stories for bed. So I may have to put some of these off until next time. But if you say you want to go, Andy, you're the last one. I thought you were going to help me with my. Um... I will help you with uploading, Lydia, but I do have to read my son's stories for sleep. That's fine. Okay. Uh, actually, so in that case, Andy, you're going to have to go next time. Remind me. Yeah, sure, I will. No worries. No, Andy. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to go ahead and stop, and 